I'm Matt Irvin and I'm known to be a model maker, but I do other things as well. But um, model making, well, model making is not exactly new. I mean, we've, we've they dug up Egyptian tombs and found models for the pharaohs, you know, ensconced with uh, them. Um, so it's been around for a good number of years. But I suppose most people these days will liken it to the modern, the, the commercial plastic model kit that you go and buy, used to be from Woolworths when they existed, um, and come home and spread glue all over the kitchen table, much to your mum's annoyance. Uh, but it's a little bit more to it than that. It started in the modern days, I suppose, in the 1930s um, with aircraft recognition models, if anybody's ever heard of those. These were silhouette models of uh, fighters and bombers, and they were made in a scale which has now become the common scale, 172. Why 172? Well, it's an engineering scale. You have to remember that Britain started the Industrial Revolution and spread its uh, technology around the world, and we were still imperial. We were working on, in the inches and feet. We weren't working in the metric system of, of centimetres, millimetres, kilometres. And if you've got a, a fighter like a Spitfire, or if we use the opposition, a Messerschmitt 109, or a bomber like the Lancaster or Heinkel 111, you could put them basically the same size, uh, and one wasn't too big and one wasn't too small. So that's in fact why the scale became set at 172. And in fact, the very first modern construction kits were made by the company called Frog, uh, and they, were, they weren't made in, in the normal plastic we associate these days, which is it's polystyrene. They were made in cellulose acetate. And if you're wondering about cellulose acetate, pick up a toothbrush or a comb. It's probably going to be made in cellulose acetate. Uh, and they made them in that scale as kits. Um, they weren't very exciting kits. You buy a modern kit to compare it with an old frog penguin. There's no comparison. The modern one is far, far, far superior. Uh, but that, that was the start of it in the late 40s, early 50s, the modern plastic construction kit started. Now, if you're British, it's going to be Airfix. That's the name you're going to know. And frankly, you say an Airfix kit, even if it's not an Airfix kit, you'll still say it's an Airfix kit. If you were in America, you'd say it was a Ravel kit. Um, but nowadays, all those names, those names actually are still going. There's a lot more beside. One thing also that's come into this is, of course, the influence of the film and television industry and the special effects industry, which is where I suppose I come in because that was my job for many years. One of the earliest to use special effects and miniatures in movies was a Frenchman called Georges Méliès. He actually was a magician, which helps if you're going to sort of fool the public what they're seeing on the screen. And in fact, there's some things that Méliès shot, we're still not quite sure, remember, of course, this is pre-CGI when you can do anything, how he actually did it. His most famous movie is, is Voyage to the Moon, where he used the rather improbable manner of shooting a cannon, uh, which admittedly Jules Verne had used in his version of it um, before, um, uh, to get his capsule onto the moon. Um, but later on, it became slightly more technical. In fact, 1929, it was, it was one of the last silent movies. The, movie, the, the, the talkies had actually come in, which is possibly why the movie wasn't really all that well remembered, except the real aficionados, uh, was uh, the Fritz Lang Frauen Mond, The Girl in the Moon. This is the freed from uh, Girl in the Moon, Frauen Mond, uh, which had the uh, technical consultancy of the space scientist Oberth to do it. And then this actually is a resin kit. It's not made of expanded polystyrene. It's made of a resin. This is a polymer, but it's actually, it doesn't glue with the standard glue. And it's made by a specialist company called Fantastic Plastic. And they, they make them out of plastic, resin is still plastic, um, and of, of the odd subjects. And this is one of them. It's a very simple kit, basically. The, the, the four legs were separate, um, and it's, it's got a base, which eventually it will sit on. And hey, it's even got a little label that uh, says Frau Mond on it. Um, and needs the top painted silver and black, and otherwise it's then finished. He actually invented the countdown. The 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. He used it in the movie. Now, people think, oh, it's must have been around for ages. No, before. What did they do before that? They probably said, 1, 2, 3, push the button, or ready, steady, go. But no, the actual countdown didn't come from real life uh, space technology. It came from a movie. But, but there, they tried to make it as accurately uh, as far as they could, as, uh, as far as the techni technicalities were concerned, given what they knew at the moment, at that particular time. And I've also got another space kit ready here. This is actually 
a Sanger, it's another oldish model, um, again has a German connection because this came about uh, well during World War II by two people, husband and wife team of Sanger Brent um, for designing what is basically a space plane. It was designed as an antipodal, antipodal bomber for getting to New York but again we are at a time when the Germans were looking to take over the world so that's what the space scientists even if they didn't really want to do that had to do uh, and this plane which would be piloted the cockpit is there uh, they're actually what we call masking over it because I sprayed it and eventually the masking will come off to reveal the interior of it the underside will be this black color the top will be silver and I should probably be detailing the various panels by putting more bits of tape over spraying them with silver to peeling the tape off so you get this mottled look like you get on any aircraft the panels never quite match and you'll eventually get the finished look as you see on the box art there interesting enough this is a model that is made in the Ukraine the Ukraine fun enough even more so than Russia has become a rather center of making these specialized models there's a good half a dozen companies producing models in plastic not necessarily resin of subjects that perhaps nobody else has ever made this is one of them later on of course you go into the 50s we've got a little bit more um, knowledge particularly after world war ii we had a particular rocket called a v2 now giving uh Werner von braun his true um credit for this he wasn't a warmonger as such although he was often cited as such he had to work with a nazi party it was a done thing at that particular time but he wanted to build space rockets and the v2 is a space rocket all right it can hold a, war, uh, a warhead and if you were in london or in antwerp at the time you didn't really want this thing coming down on top of you fortunately there wasn't that many the war ended before they could really use them but the whole idea of it he wanted to be able to make something that would go into space and carry people. There were, there were piloted plans for V2s that could actually reach orbit. But it actually gave you the design. In fact, even today, probably give any kid, draw a space rocket, they're going to draw a V2. It's going to be that shape. It's not going to be the shape of a Vostok um, in, in, from the Soviet Union or Russia or even a Saturn with, with the stepped stages that you get. It's going to be the V2 shape. It's Tintin's, Tintin's rocket in Destination Moon is a V2. And of course, the movies, which were actually very good movies in the 50s, Destination Moon and the like, what do they use? Very large V2s. It wasn't until we got to the 60s with a certain film called 2001 A Space Odyssey that the idea moved away from, let's say, the V2-shaped rockets. We got bits and pieces type craft. The Ares, the, the, the ship that carries them to the moon, was a round ball. The only real streamlined craft is the Orion, which is the one you see at the beginning. You never see it take off, but you assume it's taken off from a runway. So you saw it in, uh, in space outside the Earth's atmosphere, approaching the, the space wheel, space station. Uh, the moon bus on the moon, one of my favourite designs actually, that wasn't streamlined at all. Um, and the Discovery, the ship that actually uh, carries them on the way to Jupiter. There the Discovery was really a bits and pieces. And the model makers making that, and the original model was big, it was 60 feet long. It was a big model to get the detail on it, and the detail was taken from where? Commercial plastic kits. We call it kit bashing. You, you take the bits. Um, here in the, um, the UK, we tend to call these um, widgets. In America, they call them greeblies, but the same bits. Here's a kit. Well, that bit looks nice. It's a nice bit of plating. We'll take that. We'll stick it on there. Oh, and the thing, good thing about the kit is you can buy loads and loads of kits, and then you've got loads and loads of the same part. So you can reproduce all of that. Then, of course, that was really the only way of doing it. These days, we have a thing called 3D printing, but probably more of that later. Then you had to, here's the part, we either mould it, takes time, oh, we just buy several kits and stick it on, and that's the way those craft were made. But you end up, you don't, you don't see the bits particularly themselves. If you say, if anybody looking at it says, oh, that so-and-so bit, you've actually failed. You've actually got to disguise it so it actually becomes part of the whole. And you actually had the odd situation that when the commercial companies started building 
models of these science fiction movie models, those models themselves then got incorporated later into yet newer models. So when the model of the Space 1999 Eagle came out, you can look in later movies and you can see the girder work on it, the engines, all incorporated into later models, uh, movie and television. Um, and that, that idea will continue. I suppose the next one, I mean, after 2001, everybody, we had one of my favourite films, though not very well remembered, Silent Running, which had an even smaller cast than 2001. That didn't really have a very big cast. But there again, you've got the Valley Forge, which was supposed to be carrying the last remnants of um, greenery from Earth. And the model there, I think the model there was even bigger uh, than the Discovery from 2001. And there's something about the fact, probably wrong, probably get corrected, there were 600 Tamiya Panzer tank kits hulls used on the outside of the Valley Forge. Since then, of course, we've had another movie, or rather, should I, should I say, movie franchise, which is Star Wars, and that again took it to another level of modelling, because they were in the main models. The CGI side of it didn't really come in until the later movies, which of course are one, two, three, as against four, five, six, do the math, uh, as our American friends will say. Uh, there, they did use CGI to reproduce a lot of the craft, but to be perfectly honest, most of the time, the craft are still built as models because then the director can actually shoot the model and get what we call the frames for it. From there, you can build the CGI of it. So therefore, there's the model as a model. You've shot it all the way around, put it into the computer, simplifying this somewhat. And from there, you can then say, OK, we want to turn it this way, we want to turn it that way, we want to fly it this way, we want to fly it that way, we want to blow it up, sort of thing. And it's, it can be all done in the com in the com computer, not with the actual model. But the actual models do originally do exist. You may then do a close-up model to actually get the real detail of it. Let's use a TV example, Red Dwarf. The Red Dwarf itself, the craft, which really was a bits and pieces model. I mean, it was built actually out of foam board. It wasn't even built out of plastic. And then they had the bits stuck on it. But it was meant to be a bit of a mess anyway. The external shot you see on the, on the titles is that model. And it's, it's about, it was about six foot long. Um, and it was only built one side. You'd never saw the other side. If you don't see it, don't build it. But then you, you can just about see where the mix comes in. You mix to the painting the name on the side of it, which of course actually is done more full size. Uh, so you are mixing their life size real, as it were, with the miniatures. And that, that was done quite often. These days with CGI, frankly, you can do anything you like. And unfortunately, some people actually do. So far, I've really only dealt with spaceships because that's what people assume are going to be miniatures in film and television, whether it be Star Wars, Doctor Who, Blake 7 or whatever. But of course, miniatures can be anything. One great a proponent of those in a different subject was the wonderful Ray Harryhausen, sadly no longer with us. American who actually came and lived over in the UK and because he's well known for doing his movies uh, where he had all these fighting skeletons. Now they were done as miniatures, but they were done in stop frame. They basically, you, there's your skeleton on an arm, metal armature, which you can move very, very gradually each time. And you take one frame. Let's work on the principle that most film runs at 24 frames a second. Every second, you've got 24 frames going through, through that camera. And each time that frame moves, the model has to move. So you get this very, very long-winded way of actually, there's the skeleton model, there's Ray with it. And each time the camera shutter opens, he's moved the model, the shutter opens, uh, he closes the shutter, he moves the model a bit more, the film goes on one frame. You can say it's extremely time-consuming. And you can say, well, nobody does that that's, that way these days. Uh, Wallace and Gromit? Yep, it's done exactly the same way. That's why it takes so long for them. Yes, you could do it with CGI, and you've got wonderful companies like Pixar who are doing it with CGI, and the results are, are magnificent. But Wallace and Gromit, to us, still stands out because it's done by the old-fashioned way of stop motion. Somebody who actually worked, though was never credited, the very few credits on 2001, was a certain person called 
Brian Johnson. And of course, Brian came to everybody's notice, particularly if you were any like interested in the models and miniatures, with the Anderson films and, uh, and TV series, particularly with Space 1999. But Brian became um, well known, particularly within the industry, um, and for producing these sort of designs, and in fact went on, he did do some live action stuff as well, but as far as miniatures by live action, I mean using real people <laughs> as against puppets in the Thunderbird sense. What do people remember Jerry Anderson for? It's going to be Thunderbirds, and it, it still stands up today as being, they've tried to remake it, no, the original, because it's Thunderbirds. Um, and of course then you've got Space 1999, which was totally live action. But the miniatures are still the miniatures. They're the, they're the same. It doesn't matter if you're making it for a Thunderbird puppet or a live action person, they're still miniatures. But what about Irving himself? How did he start? Well, I started building Airfix models on the kitchen table. And from there, it was rather strange um, how I actually got into the effects industry. Because at the time I'd left school, I was, st <laughs> I was studying to be a vet, would you believe, working with animals, but I actually changed careers completely. And not knowing quite what I wanted to do, I went on a temporary holiday relief job to work for the BBC. Now, not with effects, I didn't actually even know the effects department existed at that time. And I worked for news, television news, which was a separate entity and was based at Alexandra Palace. There I worked in a photo, photo library, I was a researcher basically, but this was the time of Apollo. And we had loads and loads of pictures from NASA. NASA was very, very good at generating images of what all the space missions were going to look like. It's basically how they sold it to the public. Look at these wonderful pictures of the astronauts standing on the moon. This is, this is the spaceship in, in orbit. This is the rocket taking off. Long before they actually did that, there was artwork that went, went uh, to illustrate it. Now, of course, in the, in the photo library at the time, we had loads and loads of these images. But then so did everybody else. I mean, admittedly, the only other television side was ITN, but there were all the papers, magazines had the same images. So I, I, I came up with the idea of, oh, hang on a minute, perhaps if I do some models use, using the Airfix Lunar Module, um, we could uh, just be a bit different. And in fact, I got the editors of the programs interested and, and they started to use them. And, and, but the, I suppose my ultimate one came from Apollo 12. Uh, the second manned landing on the moon. Uh, we had number one, so people knew more or less what we look, it was going to look like. Apollo 12, though, uh, was going to be slightly different in that the plan was they were going to land next to or near to an unmanned probe, Surveyor 3, that had landed on the moon a good few years earlier. And that had sent back images uh, to the Earth, basically to find out what's the surface going to be like. Now, Apollo 12 lands on the moon and they get the cameras out and Al Bean, who was the lunar module pilot, got the camera, a TV camera out, set it on its tripod. And now remember, we are talking pre-digital cameras that everybody's got in their phone. They use what old analog tubes, called Vidicon tubes which don't like bright lights. Now, if you're on the moon, the moon itself's fine, but the sun isn't. No atmosphere, just... And he ended up pointing the camera at the sun, which immediately burnt the tube out. So that evening's news, we had sound, but no pictures. So I'd, I'd rushed home. Fortunately, I didn't live that far away at the time. Um, set up my model base with a rapidly built surveyor. I had the lunar module already from, from Apollo 11. Uh, set it up in a, in a vague idea. We knew more or less where it was. They were on the edge of a crater, the lunar module, and the surveyor was further down a slope. Anyway, did a whole roll of 36 images on film, took it back into work, because obviously we had our own labs now. They could, they could turn a roll of film around in 20 minutes. Um, we got the things out, and on that news that night, we had, had the um, astronauts talking about it, all over 14 of my pictures. I think it was the most, it's a record I ever got. So anyway, it ended up that of course I had a portfolio of pictures. Here's what's been on the news, it's actually been on, on screen. 
And at a point when you realised, of course, that I couldn't spend my life in researching pictures in the Stills Library of BBC TV News, I looked around and uh, found there was, and of course, one watched Doctor Who, and you thought, well, it must be Pete. Who does these? And I did a bit of research and found out there was a department called the Visual Effects Department, run by a gentleman manager called Jack Kine, who'd started the department in 1954 with another gentleman called Bernard Wilkie, and they're both still there. Anyway, my um, my boss in the, in the in the library, he did an internal memo or somewhere about this guy Matt. He'd like to come along, and anyway, I Jack said yes. He'd he'd. Um, uh, see me and I, I went to went along to his office and um, showed him all the pictures I'd done including of course all the Apollo 12 stuff and uh, okay, Mr Kine at the time uh, uh, Jack <laughs> obviously after that um, said well we could do with somebody or other uh, we're setting up a new department the Open University Department uh, to make models for that under a one of our designers called Jerry Abouaf, he said, would you be able to do that? And I said, one says, of course, yes, of course I can do that. So anyway, I go and meet Jerry and he starts me off building these scientific type models and mathematical models. And I did that for about a year or so, actually. What he did actually teach me, I was working with all the materials I'd use for, shall we say, more general effects, as in Doctor Who, um, perspex, wood, metal to a certain extent, resin. Jerry was a sculptor. He taught me a lot about perspective and things like that, which I didn't really know about. I still use what Jerry taught me about perspective when I'm drawing things out. Moulding, he was a very good sculptor as well, which frankly I'm not a very good sculptor, but I know the techniques. And eventually I went back down to the department. I, Jack called me in, he said, will you come down and help on? And the first job I actually did was helping uh, a well-known uh, effects guy called Ian Schoons, wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, taught, he taught me a, a heck of a lot about the actual um, co core of effects, particularly for science fiction type of things, because he'd worked for Anderson in the past. And basically, Jack said, I'll oh, come down for a couple of weeks, and I sort of stayed for about 25 years. So either somebody lost the paperwork or they thought I was particularly reasonable at, at it. And from there, I... I worked as an assistant working on many, many programs. I became a designer. The first design job I did was uh, Doctor Who uh, Face of Evil. Uh, and from there, never really looked back, I suppose. I do try and keep a few models on display. And here is about the only area I've got. It's a mix of cars, space, science fiction and things. Oh, including a couple of fairly well-known robots. Here we've got Robbie the robot from the movie Forbidden Planet and his cousin, with his cousin because in fact the same person played him, uh, from Lost in Space, the forever unknown, unnamed robot from Lost in Space. Actually, interestingly here, I've just realised I've got the largest scale, or the smallest scale, depending on which way you look at it. This is a space colony, the sort of thing that was proposed by Professor Gerald K. O'Neill back in the 70s, the high frontier time. These would be for living in space of hundreds of thousands of people, and I'm saying that number because these things would be enormous. They would be probably 50 kilometres long, uh, which makes the scale of this something like one two hundred millionth beat that. <laughs> oh, and by the way, of course, we also have this. And if you may recognize this because it's my logo. This model was built for one of those BBC Two two-hour programs, The Key to the Universe. And I built Clavius key uh, with my lucky number seven on it and we use this uh, during the program and in fact later programs as well it was on a tomorrow's world once it was even on top of the pops i often get asked actually what was the favorite program i ever worked on and, and, and frankly people do expect me to say doctor or blake seven no i'm sorry it wasn't it was magnox and at which point they all say what's magnox i said you know it's edge of darkness oh 
Um, how do you get that to do that? And I said, well, basically, I went in and said, look, I haven't done any locations for some time. I've been working in the model stage. And in the model stage, basically, it's dark in there. It's grubby. You come out, look a bit like a pan because of all the dirt been flying around. And the world could have ended, as far as you know. And I said, so how about a bit of location? All right, have this. We don't know what it is. They'd written Magnox up on the board. And I said, well, with my vague scientific background, I said, well, Magnox is magnesium non-oxidized. It's, it's a nuclear process. Still didn't tell us anything about the program they were actually doing. But I got onto that, and um, that was six months' shoot, brought forward by a year. So we had the writer, Troy Kennedy Martin, on location with us, writing as he went along. And none of us really knew what it was all about. It had this new uh, director called Martin Campbell. I don't remember doing anything before. And when we first started seeing the rushes coming back, because again, it was, this was all on film, um, and we thought, okay, that's what we're working towards, great. And we all basically put everything out to get this thing done. And it, it was a lot of effort, because I said the script wasn't written. We were literally almost making a lot of it up as we went along. I was there with three or three assistants. We're all in it at some point. I'm one of the frogmen with my, one of my assistants, Sinclair, in the boat when we recover the body out of the reservoir, because we already had the wetsuits, we were already going in the water and it was our bodies so we did that uh, so basically all the crew were in it at some point and it was rather galling because I was the one who got interviewed all the time I was on I think Nationwide or similar or whatever it was because they had this controversial shooting of Emma played by Joanne Wally who was I think it was her first major production or even minor production um, the daughter of Craven the main star of it played by Bob Peck um, very, very early on, and when she reappears, you never quite know, is she a ghost, or is actually Craven just imagining that she's there? Which also brings Magnox slightly into the realms of fantasy, as against just straightforward drama. So we have got that slightly um, uh, fantastic element to, to it, to, to this all. Uh, but there we actually did it, and, and Joanne, give her a due, apart from one shot, which the, her stunt uh, advisor did instead, she did it all we, we actually shot her with a shotgun using a body plate we demonstrated to her first thought this is actually what's going to happen and Joe she's not very big either so we had this massive plate fitted to her it, plus it was raining and of course that was effects rain because we filmed this in Yorkshire in the middle of a drought and those are two words Yorkshire and drought that don't often come up but yes we filmed this in the middle of a drought Magnox was the big hit for BBC in that particular year, 1985, and it was nominated for probably around 13 BAFTAs and got about 11. The figures may be wrong, but it was something like that. It was a large number of it. Unfortunately, not for effects. It's the best BAFTA I never got, because at that particular time, BAFTA had no category for television special effects. Film, yes, not television, and the two were separate at that particular point. Does now, but not then. Of course, doing Magnox, or as it's generally known now, Edge of Darkness, uh, was not the only thing I ever did. Um, in working in effects department, you basically did everything. Obviously, some were better than others. I was all right known as a model maker. And when I went on to programs such as Swap Shop and Superstore, kids programs, they got me on originally uh, because I knew the editor of the program because we'd actually worked um, when I was at the photo library. And do you remember I went to effects? So I went on and they found, basically, I get in front of a camera, remember this is live, unrehearsed, and it's three hours long, the whole programme, uh, and didn't fall apart. Well, I have to say, a lot of my colleagues were somewhat scared about doing that. Um, but I could actually found, oh, you can do it. In fact, the second time I was asked on to do what would have been originally Swap Shop, I said, well, you've had me, um, why not have one of my colleagues? I was, I was being very magnanimous at the time, but then they turned around and said, well, yeah, but they know you and you can do it. Oh, all right, okay. So I got known for doing it, that I actually go in on Saturday mornings, um, basically mug up. We, we vaguely, I vaguely knew what I was going to be doing. I was going to be talking about effects for whatever program was working on or I'd talk about a space project that was going on. I remember going on, we were doing Rent-A-Ghost. We all did one season of Rent-A-Ghost and I'd built a Batmobile. And the Batmobile was actually like the TV, t the original TV Batmobile built by George Barris um, for the series with Adam West and Burt Ward. 
and I built it out of a Triumph Herald, or my, my assistants built it out of a Triumph Herald. It, had, it already had the fins, so it looked very, very similar. And we bought this rather completely rusty Triumph Herald and built it as the Batmobile. And uh, I went on once to talk about that, that this was coming up, watch rent a ghost during the week because you'll see this. And we wanted to show it. Now, Television Centre, when it was being used for programmes, had this long ramp round the car park that drove up to reception uh, where you went in to the reception and then into the studios. Right Now, the cameras are all set up at the top of this ramp. And I was in the Triumph Herald and Chegas, Keith Chegerman, was with me. Now, <laughs> it's one of those things you, th you look back on it and you, your heart, but at the time... We'd used the car a lot. Now, according to health and safety, all we could have in the tank was one litre of petrol, uh, which is not a lot. It's enough just to run it backwards and forwards until you top it up again. And we're sitting at the bottom of the ramp, so think, we've got to go up a hill. And we're waiting, these walkie-talkies, you know, waiting to get the queue. Remember, this is live. And Chegas looks at the fuel gauge and says, have you got any petrol? And I'm thinking something unprintable. I'm, oh my God, we haven't topped up. It's still, we got to the top of the ramp, but I think it was running on fumes at the time. We just had to go this, but we, we did it. But it's one of those things you think, I haven't topped up the fuel, but we, we got there. All right, go on and talk about our um, space projects. I remember doing the Halley Comet encounter with Giotto, the European space probe built in the UK, or mostly built in the UK. Um, and I remember talking about that. So that was something not to do with effects at all. Although, OK, I've got a model of Giotto. We took it along and sat it on the table in front of me and uh, probably John Craven. And of course, in the department itself, we all did everything anyway. I mean, I got known because I had a scientific background for doing things like Tomorrow's World, Horizon, um, QED, if everybody remembers QED, um, and a number of the um, special one-off programmes at BBC. BBC Two seemed to love doing these two-hour science specials, um, you know, sort of thing, bring your sandwiches along, uh, because they, they did, I think there might have been one slight break in the middle, but that was about it, otherwise it was two hours of solid science. And then later Blake Seven, which is, I suppose, is where I became more well known for doing. Um, and but of course, in there, we are doing all the effects. So it's not just building the Liberator or flying the Liberator or the Pursuit ships or the Atlee shuttle, one of which is behind me here, um, or even the flying hair dryers, which I put just for those who know what the flying hair dryers are. They're behind me. Um, but we also did, we produced the guns, the transporter bracelets, all the effects that needed to be seen on screen, things like Aurac, is, is Aurac an effect or a person, you know, and of course for Doctor Who, we, we bring in K9. Sharing the workshop, and frankly getting in the way sometimes, is this beast as I seem to be the keeper of him. Yes, it's K9, the one and only, there is only one K9, as K9 will often demonstrate. He sits here, we do take his ears off, or his communicators off, and his tail, because it's easier. But otherwise he sits here, most of the time behaving himself. And sometimes I even get the uh, radio control out and take him for a run around the block, much to the amusement of the cats. But of course it all started with me sitting at a bench building an airfix model but and i still do that i still i write for various magazines and i consult with many of the model companies around the world particularly on space projects about what should we do should we reissue that what should we do this particular time and i still build stuff for myself even every now and again i tend to limit myself to space because all right that's supposedly work um, and cars. Cars has always been my first love as far as modelling goes, and particularly American cars. I drive American cars anyway, full-size ones, and I've probably got the biggest collection of uh, built model kits of American cars, or cars in general, um, certainly in the UK, maybe, who knows, in the world. Things these days, cutting out a heck of a lot, have changed somewhat. The two shilling, that's 10p in decimal money, uh, no longer exists. I mean, the equivalent is probably going to be, you're going to be paying £5, £6, if not £10, for the same sort of model. But paying £100, <laughs> which then would be unthinkable, 
it, it's, it's now, I've, <clears throat> I admit I've done it myself, I wanted a particular thing, oh, it's kind of, oh God, but hey, you know, if you want the sort of thing, that's what sort of thing you've got to pay for. But what you get these days is a vast, vast, vast improvement. The amount of pa parts you've got. Every skits in the old days, 20 parts possibly, maybe 30. These days there are kits that are well over a thousand parts. They're not just plastic either. You get white metal parts for undercarriage legs, always a weak point, point on air, aircraft. And you started getting the use of materials called photo etching, which is a flat sheet of metal, it can be cut with scissors. They give you very, very fine details. You can get white metal parts, you can get resin parts, uh, short run resin parts. So you're getting these multi-material kits, not just plastic kits. And that's the way the modern kits are going. Gluing a plastic kit together. In the old days, the tube of polystyrene cement. You can still get them. Very, very few people use it. It's liquid cement. This is a liquid which you run along the line. It immediately uh, grips the plastic, melts in ever so slightly. There's your joint. If you do it right, it's stronger than the plastic itself. Uh, and of course, it doesn't leave any residue. There are stories, which is actually true, I've, I've come across them myself, using the old tube cement. You get, a, get a something, you need a long line, a, sh a ship hull is a classic example. You run a great big dollop of glue inside it, right? And it, it dries. It doesn't quite, it's still soft. We've had models we've, we've examined which are decades old. That glue is still soft inside them. You don't get that with liquid. Painting. In the old days, what you did, you got a little pot of paint and a brush and you stack your brush and you, you stirred up the paint with the, the, the good end of the brush, which you should never do. Use at least the other end or, or a, uh, a kebab stick or something like that. And then you slapped it on the model. Oh, it's great. Wonderful. Uh, and then things like airbrushes came in or we used to call them spray guns or airbrushes really now where you could do and spray cans where you can get, particularly on cars, you can get all the wonderful colours that cars, cars come in, all the, all the metal flakes and candy colours and the transparent, all that sort of thing, particularly American cars come in. And so you started to, to do spraying the cars, you've got a much better finish. And of course, there's no reason why you can't spray aircraft, ships, tanks, anything else. Of course, I've got to store the models somewhere other than most of them end up here. And in fact, these veg boxes come in very, very useful because you can stack them. And what have I got in this one, for example? Oh, look. I've got Explorer Rocket there, and I've got... Oh, this is the first nuclear-powered ship, the Savannah, or the nuclear-powered um, commercial vessel, the Savannah. So they're in there. They're probably all to be sorted at some point. Oh, I seem to, I seem to have, a, have a Buran, the Russian space shuttle, in there as well. But some things actually, frankly, are a bit too big for boxes, so... I have to hang on from the ceiling. What's this? Well, actually, it's a photon rocket. It's a model of a design which, in theory, could work. You're using two big tanks, matter, antimatter, think of your Star Trek Enterprise, uh, combining, producing a beam of light, which, of course, is, is running at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. Do the maths if you want to convert it into metric. Uh, propelling the ship very, very slowly, but over vast distances. This is a large model I made for exhibition purposes, actually, because, frankly, it's big enough to hang from the ceiling and to point out that sort of thing. Mind you, while we're on the stars, there's another one here as well. Daedalus, the British Interplanetary Society designed for a spaceship, unmanned, uh, to go to the star, Barnard Star, about seven light years away. Uh, in theory, it would work. We haven't so far built it yet. Mind you, the good thing about these boxes is the shape they are, they're very good for storing the cars. This is part of my James Bond connection. Always had a fascination with all the cars. Some we know are more famous than others. I don't have to tell you what that one is. But hey, do you recognise this one? It's a Ford Ranchero, which is a, a little pickup version of, of, the, of the Falcon uh, ordinary sedan. But it's got a load in the back of it. And what was that load? That load was a crushed... Lincoln Continental that had the body of one of the villains in the back of it and a lot of gold in the trunk. Uh, there was a slight problem with that. The Lincoln weighs about three tonnes. The Ranchero would take about half a tonne maximum, so something had to give. It was probably the suspension of the Ranchero. Oh, what have we got here? Oh, right, yeah, more space stuff, right. Now, we mentioned 2001. This is a little resin model, specialist model, of the Ares, the one that landed on the moon into the 
crater and they opened up and it dropped down inside of it and also in the same box I appear to have a couple of this is the America's first successfully or would have been the first successful launch satellite Vanguard this is the one that didn't quite work Bing Americans they show you the blow up on the pad which the Soviet unit at the time didn't and they've got two versions of this this is one how it would appear in orbit all silver and chrome and this is like the display model this is actually how you build the kit up actually which has got all the labels and things on it Project Vanguard The story behind this model is quite interesting because this is a model I built many years ago, even though I've forgotten exactly how long ago, of Cellini. And if you know your Arthur C. Clarke stories and you know his story, A Fall of Moon Dust, this is the star space ship, or right, so it's just a bus actually, a ship, a yacht, which sails on a sea of moon dust. Do the sort of things exist? We don't know. We've only explored mm, tiny percent of the moon's surface. There could be these bowls of moon dust. And the, there's a moon quake, uh, there's a whirlpool created, and the bus sinks. I mean, strictly speaking, although, okay, it's Arthur C. Clarke science fiction, but it's more like a disaster movie. It's the Poseidon adventure on the moon. And I did actually write a script for it to be filmed, and I've got a lot of it sorted out. We had set designers, DPs, directors of photography, everybody casting sort of sorted out. Um, hasn't got green lit. Anybody, anybody's got a spare money they want to put into it, that will be absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. And also this is leading into what is a brand new technique, one of 3D printing. Now 3D printing is a complete world in its own right because we're not just talking about model kits, we're talking about anything it can be 3D printed. There's a 3D printer on the International Space Station that can turn out particular tool parts. Basically, it's called a additive manufacturing because you're adding material to build up in layers. There's an interesting point, uh, which I pointed out in one of my books, because the question I asked, of people say, oh, who invented the 3D printer? I reckon it was Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur, in the 1960s, wrote a book called Profiles of the Future. In it, he gave a timeline of when he thought things. He wasn't predicting, he was just saying this is the sort of time. Arthur was the first to admit he got the man landing on the moon wrong by at least a decade. It was earlier than he actually predicted. He put it well into the 70s, because it was 1969. Um, but in one of these lists he gives the timelines, he, gives, he comes up with a 3D photocopier. Now, a photocopier, obviously, they've been around for a good number of years. I mean, they've got a lot more sophisticated these days. But what he imagined was a photocopier doing one pass. Oh, what if he could do several parts? Boom, boom, and build up, build up, build up. That's 3D printing. So, unfortunately, Arthur's no longer alive to actually for me to tell him. So, yes, you did invent 3D printing, Arthur. That's the way things, I think, will be going. 3D Printing is still used in the, in the model making, the uh, amateur model making industry quite a lot. Um, it's used certainly in the professional model making industry to produce prototype parts, which then perhaps you can then take a mold off and then produce up parts a lot quicker. That is the problem with 3D printing. It's slow. Um, until it speeds up, it won't become a common household item a la the replicator in Star Trek and still probably won't be quite uh, in the immortal words of Jean-Luc Picard, uh, T. Earl Grey hot. No, it will be manufacture me the cup to push it in, manufacture me the correct tea bags, manufacture me some hot water and combine them all together, in which case it's actually probably quicker to put the kettle on. <laughs>